Hello, I'm Jack Perkins. Welcome to Time Machine. For thousands of years, one of the most enduring symbols of evil has been the witch. What do you see in your mind's eye at the word witch? An old hag dressed in black, wart on her nose, flying on a broomstick, her bone-chilling cackle striking fear into hearts? Well, that is the stereotypical witch that we've come to know and despise from fairy tales. But in real life, people of all shapes and sizes have been accused of being witches, and sometimes their stories are more terrifying than any in Mother Goose. Witches. These are the images modern Americans conjure up when they think of witches and witchcraft. Well, America has a long history of religious intolerance and persecuting people for their religion. For more than 300 years, witches have been persecuted, from the Salem witches to the modern-day practitioners of ancient voodoo rites. The most notorious episode of mass persecution of so-called witches began here. It was near the end of the 17th century in Massachusetts Bay Colony. Watching this reenactment, Salem tourists still experience a sense of the hysteria that gripped that small town back in 1692. Can you not hear this? This is madness! A plague comes among us and you sit silence and you listen and you believe if they are allowed to continue we will all be witches and devils quickly the colonists of salem had just endured another long and bitter winter crops were scarce taxes were high smallpox was rampant and they were surrounded by indians whom they called savages these Native Americans practiced ceremonies that seemed strange and supernatural to the Europeans. The Puritans looked at Indian customs and saw the hand of the devil. The Indians were seen as a constant threat and enemy on the one hand and as a scapegoat on the other. It was no wonder then that the Salem witch hunts began with the arrest of Tituba a West Indian slave owned by the Reverend Samuel Paris. Torn from her exotic island homeland of Barbados, Tituba lived in the unfamiliar surroundings of Salem Village, where she spent her time tending to Elizabeth Paris, the bored and restless daughter of Samuel Paris. Here in a darkened kitchen, Tituba entertained Elizabeth and her cousin Abigail Williams teaching them the art of fortune telling and instructing them in ritual chanting and dancing. Well, Tichaber brought with her to the Salem colony all of the folk beliefs and practices of Western Africa. Uh, she was a slave and, of course, she was somewhat learned in practices of fortune telling, popular divination. In their excitement, the girls began to share Tituba's forbidden secrets with friends. They invited other young Puritans to join their circle at the Paris home to read palms, tell fortunes, and to dance. But their fun was soon spoiled when the adults became suspicious of this bizarre behavior. They see either the punishing hand of God or the work of Satan at work in their lives. When the girls began to have traumatic convulsions, hysterical fits that caused their bodies to twist and jerk uncontrollably, the adults attributed these symptoms to demonic possession. When the young women involved began having hysterical fits and outbreaks, um, 
when they were given to writhing on the floor, uh, speaking in unintelligible phrases, fingers began to point to Tichuba. Since Tichuba was an outsider to the Puritan religion, it was easy for everyone to believe that she was a witch. But then the girls went on to name Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne, two elderly neighbors who fit the description of an English witch. We as human beings have a tendency to associate evilness with ugliness. And uh, given the way our gender codes work, given the way we think about relationships between men and women, we often don't know what to do with the elderly, especially if they're not very pleasant to look at. <laughs> Mass hysteria consumed the village. Stories of witches in Salem spread like wildfire. To the villagers, the stories were proof that an angry god was punishing them by allowing witches and other hardships to plague Salem. Protect us, the devil has come to Salem! The assumption was that this was a sign from God that something was wrong. And frequently it had to do with improper worship of one kind or another. If you are so holy, Goody Proctor, could you say for us now the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Events then moved swiftly. A court was set up. Hundreds of people, most of them women, were accused of being witches and called to stand trial. Some people have called the, the uh, great witch hunts of Western Europe uh, and the witch hunts in England and the Salem witch trials as all part of, for lack of a better term, a women's holocaust. They were stripped and searched for mole-like growths believed to be the marks of the devil. It could be as simple as a birthmark. It could be as uh, simple as a port wine stain, a defective birth. Um, it could be a wound, a scar. It was as simple as pointing a finger at a next door neighbor. The key problem with the Salem evidence was that it was spectral in nature. And by that, I mean that an individual's apparition or his appearance could commit the supposed crime. By the end of that summer, 1692, 19 people had been hanged. It is the last of the great witch scares, but it's almost as though it moves from Europe, continental Europe, to England, to the United States. Belief in witchcraft was very powerful among the Puritans. The religious beliefs was in fact the source of great conflict in the community and really fostered that whole situation that existed in 1692. Although the Salem witch hunt had ended, fear of witches and witchcraft would continue to haunt Americans for centuries to follow. He was born woman, part woman, part man, part cat, and a whole lot of devil. Grace Sherwood, the mysterious witch of Pungo, is Virginia's most celebrated witch. Of course, Grace was an attractive woman, and she wore men's trousers, which was kind of unheard of back in the 1700s. The legendary witch is said to have lived in this house in the early 18th century. She was a self-assured, independent woman. So she must have been a witch, right? That's the logic, that's the reasoning. Uh, that, that alone throughout history has been enough to condemn women for witchery. Okay. From Joan of Arc to Sinead O'Connor, people have made this claim in this charge. Grace Sherwood was one of the few women to be tried for witchcraft after the Salem cases. Her ordeal began in court in 1697, when she and her husband James lost a libel suit brought against their neighbors, John and Jane Gisborne. 
the uh, Gisborns accused Grace of blowing her bewitched breath on their cotton crop and uh, causing the cotton uh, to not, their, their crop that they had, not to be up to the standards of, of the, what they expected. So again, uh, Miss Gisborne accused her of being a witch. A year later, the rumors intensified. The Sherwoods were furious, seeking vengeance. They brought yet another lawsuit against Anthony and Elizabeth Barnes, and again they lost. Tales of a black cat and black magic suddenly transformed this 18th century legal battle into a mysterious tale that still intrigues the townsfolk of Pungo. She attacked uh, Elizabeth Barnes. She jumped on her back. Her fingernails turned to, to claws like on a cat. Teeth sprung out of her mouth like fangs. She had to have blood. The devil is what she called her. And she sucked on this woman's neck until her mouth was full of blood. And then she escaped out the door as a cat, as it's told. This version of the testimony seems preposterous today, but it conveys the fear that many early Americans had of people accused of witchcraft. By the spring of 1706, the general court had grown weary of these suspicious reports and decided to launch a full-scale investigation of Grace Sherwood. The judge told the sheriff to get a, a jury of uh, 12 women to search uh, Grace to see if she had any signs of being a witch and to go to her home and search the area. Well. He called together a, a group of 12 ladies. And unfortunately for Grace, Elizabeth Barnes, who had accused her of the black cat proposition, was the jury foreman. So anyway, they searched her, and they said that they found two things of black color on her privates, such as a tit. With only this evidence, the judge ordered Grace jailed in the old courthouse. It was here where this old farmhouse now stands, that Grace waited in shackles for her brutal medieval ordeal by water known as the ducking trial. The whole theory behind that uh, was that if you were, were a witch, that the water was pure, and if you were a witch and were dunked in the water, you would not, the water would not accept you. It would merely, uh, you would swim or live through it. So uh, it was kind of crazy in a way because uh, Grace couldn't win either way. On July 10th, 1706, Grace was taken down to the Lynn Haven River to a place now known as Witch Duck Point. She did not drown. She floated. And they took her out and searched her again. And then they took her over and put her in the jail uh, where she stayed. Although Grace spent seven years in jail awaiting another ordeal, no further trials were held. Grace was released and lived to be 80 years old. Even in death, the legendary Grace was true to character. She was on her deathbed and she beckoned her three sons to come to her. And in doing so, she asked that they take her out of her bed, lay her feet in the ashes of the fireplace. And with that, there was a terrible storm going on outside. And a gust of wind came down the chimney, blew out the fire. And when the fire rekindled, Grace was gone. The devil had come to claim his own. And the only thing left were the two hooves of her heels in the ashes. Even though the Sherwood trial was an isolated episode in the history of 18th century Virginia, these kinds of fanciful tales still haunt the superstitious subconscious of American history. Stories like The Witch of Pungo make modern-day Americans more susceptible to headlines and TV specials that focus on devil worshipers and black magic, rather than on examinations of the more mundane beliefs and practices of those Americans who still call themselves witches. As long as the public has this idea of witch, 
as uh, initially someone who rides a broomstick with black robes flowing and a black hat and so forth. There's no hope for the neo-pagans to be able to change the public perception of a witch. Anybody involved with psychic phenomena or what's been called the occult has been discriminated against in the American culture almost from the beginning. Some early European immigrants to the U.S. tried to practice non-Christian rituals like this one, rituals that have been passed down from the pagan times of pre-Christian Europe. Hail and welcome. But in the 1600s, these rituals were misunderstood by the Christian ruling class and were forced underground. The religious beliefs and practices of other cultures have also been greatly misunderstood. The Chinese immigrants brought with them a belief in spirits and demons. Their original New Year's celebration included ceremonies like this to appease the ghosts of their ancestors, drive away demons, and ward off bad luck. I'm sure that, that traditionally the use of firecrackers was meant to scare away, chase away the baleful spirits, but they're very festive and they're a lot of fun. So, I mean, they serve a dual function. These misunderstandings often contributed to the violence that occurred as a result of cultural differences. Perhaps the most tragic example can be seen in Native American history. These are the descendants of Sitting Bull, the once great leader of the Sioux Nation. In the late 1800s, the Sioux were so desperate to defeat the United States Army that they followed the advice of prophets who introduced the ghost dance. In battles with white soldiers, the ghost dancers believed that the spirits would protect them from bullets. These were people who felt that their culture was dying and it was an effort to both revitalize the culture spiritually and to provide real resistance against white encroachment onto Indian lands. Uh, the ghost dance was an extremely powerful force for change and political organization, especially in the Midwest. As a result of these misconceptions, many religions identified with witchcraft have been driven underground. It happened first with voodoo in the city of New Orleans in the early 19th century. Voodoo originated in Africa and Haiti. It was brought to New Orleans by slaves. Voodoo is an Afro-Caribbean religion. It is based originally upon the religion of the Yoruba people, and it comes from West Africa. And it is uh, an extremely complex polytheist, seemingly polytheistic faith with one god at the top of the pantheon. <laughs> From the beginning, Christian slave owners feared the worship of African gods. Slaves caught performing ritual dances or chants were severely punished. To protect their native beliefs, the practitioners of voodoo met in secret and camouflaged their religion by incorporating elements of Catholicism. Remember that those practices were outlawed by the Catholic Church. The drum, for instance, was always outlawed by the Catholics, be they Spanish or French. So people had to find ways of expressing their religious beliefs and sentiments through the mediating influences of Catholic symbology. Okay? So, for instance, they would observe the feast days of the saints, but in their minds and in their hearts, they would actually be observing the festival days of their gods. Marie Laveau, New Orleans' most famous voodoo queen, was Catholic. 
At first, Laveau made her living as a hairdresser, but she soon realized that she could profit much more as a voudin. By the 1830s, she had established a cult and was a very successful voodoo queen. If you ask those who consider themselves to be in the lineage of Marie Laveau, whether or not she was a true priestess of voodoo, they will say yes. If you ask other practitioners of voodoo about her, they will say, well, she was just a hairstylist who listened to gossip and knew a little bit about root magic. Although New Orleans voodoo incorporated some Catholic rites, practitioners never worshiped the Christian God. If you look closely at what's going on in voodoo from a Roman Catholic perspective or a Christian perspective, they are not worshiping Jesus Christ as he is portrayed in the Bible and in Christian tradition, as he's understood in Christian tradition, they are worshiping an African spirit who has been given the name Jesus Christ. It was Marie Laveau who brought Catholic prayers and statues into the voodoo religion. When a religion is outlawed, it must go underground. It has to find different ways of expressing itself. These religions are extremely flexible. They're very syncretistic. Okay? They can draw upon various other traditions, and they can use their symbolisms, and they can do it comfortably. Voodoo, as practiced in New Orleans by Marie Laveau, used herbs and powders to conjure both good and evil spells. Some magical brews worked to heal the sick and help the less fortunate. Others were expressly made to bewitch and curse enemies. However, it is the infamous image of a pin-studded doll that is popularized by fictional film and TV. That's as much a matter of Hollywood and novels about voodoo in Haiti as it is about anything else. It is not the centerpiece of the religion. In fact, voodoo practitioners, people who observe voodoo as a religion, don't use voodoo dolls. And today, these followers are trying to dispel the stereotypes of evil voodoo and black magic. This woman, a high priestess of Haitian voodoo, is one of many practitioners who deny that pin-studded voodoo dolls and wicked spells play any role in their religion. She practices here in the tiny basement of her North Philadelphia home, where hundreds of people call on her seeking psychic advice, home-brewed remedies, and good luck charms, all in exchange for money. As part of their training, the priest or priestess of voodoo has learned how to use herbal remedies and natural remedies. So it's very much a part of the religion. Although traditional African voodoo is known for its mysterious spells and divine intercession, other cultures and religions have beliefs and practices based on magic and spiritual healing. There is a deep-seated need in people to believe in the power of unseen forces, and uh, that's often culturally based or culturally encoded. You have people who, for some illnesses, are willing to go to a, a modern allopathic doctor, and for other purposes, they go to the local natural healer. Okay, and that still goes on today. The Pennsylvania Dutch are one of the many cultures that still hold with the superstitions of hexery and home remedies. My ancestors and, and a lot of people in this area, um, they were very religious, but they were also very superstitious. Um, they believe that certain symbols prevented bad luck. Or, or brought them good luck. In Lancaster County, hex signs, geometric designs, are painted on barns. These symbols are supposed to ward off evil and bring good luck. Most folk traditions brought to Pennsylvania by Swiss Germans were harmless superstitions. 
But in one fascinating case, the murder of a witch doctor was the only way out to break a deadly curse. This hex murder led to one of the most unusual homicide trials in Pennsylvania history. A story of witches and spells that took place less than 70 years ago. In the 1920s, John Blymeyer was a resident of York, Pennsylvania. He was a wanderer. And in the, throughout the years before 1928, he had had a great deal of difficulty. He had uh, uh, been sort of drifting around, looking for work. His wife had left him. Uh, three of, two of his three children had died. And uh, he was more and more convinced that he was having these difficulties because someone had put a spell on him. John Blymeyer was descended from a long line of powwow doctors who had earned their livelihoods through supposed powers to hex or heal. With this unusual family history, it was not surprising when Blymeyer became a victim of his own superstitions. He went from one powwow doctor to another. Uh, some reports have it that he, that he talked to some 15 or 16 around York in an effort to find a way to resolve his problems. In a state of deep depression, Blymeyer roamed the streets of York, where in the winter of 1928, he met John Curry, a runaway who greatly sympathized with Blymeyer. Curry was a kind of waif of the street. So Blymeyer and Curry had common cause in the sense that they were both unfortunate individuals and wanderers, uh, sort of what we would call today, I suppose, street people. In a final desperate attempt to discover the source of his curse, Blymeyer traveled across the county to consult with yet another powwow doctor, a woman renowned for her skills at hexery. Finally, he went to Mrs. Knoll, who lived in Marietta on the western edge of Lancaster County, just across the Susquehanna River. He consulted with Mrs. Knoll on several occasions. Mrs. Knoll told him that he was under a spell and that the person responsible for the spell or the curse was Nelson Raymeyer from Raymeyer's Hollow. Raymeyer was a farmer and also a powwow doctor, and he had once been John Blymeyer's employer. Blymeyer knew Raymeyer. Uh, Raymeyer had a little farm down in Raymeyer's Hollow, some 12 or 13 miles south of York. And Blymeyer had picked potatoes for Raymeyer on his farm several summers. The thing that confirmed in his mind that he was under a curse uh, put on him by Nelson Raymeyer was the fact that Mrs. Knoll took a dollar bill and put it in the palm of his left hand. And as he looked, at the picture of Washington on the dollar bill. It changed into the picture of Nelson Raymeyer. John Blymeyer not only believed that Nelson Raymeyer was responsible for his curse, but also for the misfortunes of his friend, John Curry, and Wilbert Hess, a boy whose entire family felt bewitched. So the whole Hess family believed that they were suffering under some kind of a curse. Eager to break this hex, Blymeyer continued to consult with Mrs. Knoll. Now, in the course of Blymeyer's conversations with Mrs. Knoll, she finally told him how he could break the curse. And what she told him he had to do was to go down to Raymeyer's house, Raymeyer's Hollow, which incidentally was a very isolated and lonely place, go down to Raymeyer's house and get a lock of Raymeyer's hair and bury it six feet in the ground. This would break the curse. Now, Blymeyer had to act. To help break the spell, he enlisted the aid of his friend, John Curry. But they were unsuccessful in getting a lock of hair. Because Raymeyer was a big, big man, and they didn't, they were reluctant to tackle him until they had more, more help. 
On the night of November 27, 1928, Blymeyer and Curry returned to Ray Meyer's house, this time with more muscle, Wilbert Hess. Ray Meyer turned to put wood in the stove in his kitchen. Curry and Blymeyer packed him and started to wrestle him to the floor in an effort to get a lock of his hair. The struggle escalated. It went from the use of bare fists, to the use of chair rungs, to the use of blocks of wood. And it became a vicious, bloody encounter. Finally, after they literally, literally beat the life out of this uh, man, they put a rope around his neck and had him on the floor of course, discovered that he was dead. They then doused the body with kerosene. They lit a match to it, and off they went. But even Ray Meyer's death could not dispel Blymeyer's fear. Blymeyer, at the trial, testified that when he looked back, he thought he saw the form of Nelson Raymeyer spectral form of Nelson Raymar moving about in the fire. Three days later, a neighbor summoned the coroner after discovering the partially burned and decomposed body of Nelson Raymar. Within two days, Blymeyer, Curry, and Hess were all arrested. They, of course, had been apprehended quickly and put in jail. They all made confessions. On trial, both Blymeyer and Curry faced a cold and unyielding jury. So the, uh, the Curry jury came back with the same result as the Blymeyer jury. They came back with murder one, first degree, and a recommendation of life imprisonment. And it was a very, very tragic situation, particularly for the young boy, Curry. When Wilbert Hess came to trial, his defense attorney, Harvey Gross, portrayed Hess as a victim of witchcraft delusion. With this unusual argument, Gross won the sympathy of the jury. He says that it was in the grip of this awful power that Wilbert went down to the hollow that night, believing that his parents and his family were living in mortal peril. And under the spell, Wilbert had no choice the road to the hollow was his road to Gethsemane. His presence at Ray Meyer's house was his dark night at Golgotha. The verdict shocked York County Court. Although Hess was a member of this murderous trio, he received a considerably lighter sentence than his counterparts, murder in the second degree. The trial became headline news across the United States. And then, of course, the papers, day after day, ran stories about this brutal, vicious murder that had been the product, had been stimulated, had been brought about as a result of a belief in witchcraft. And suddenly, suddenly, York County became the cockpit of witchcraft. And people all over the country, all over the nation, began pointing to York County as the place where people were so committed to a belief in witches and witchcraft that they were prepared to murder as a result of this, this belief. That was almost 70 years ago. This is today. Guardians of the South, we invoke you. May the fires of renewal burn brightly in our lives. Hail and welcome. Hail and welcome. People are still fascinated with witches and witchcraft. Called Satanism, and in some cases, to be driven into committing terrible deeds. Whether myth or reality. You get a lot of press on these half hour early evening shows that are out to scandalize and, and shock us. And so they talk about blood sucking cults and baby eating cults. and garbage-eating cults, and so forth and so on. 
as you receive the fire, think of the gifts of fire, of the warmth of our campfire, for which we surround monthly, of the summer that is to come, the warmth of the sun, and all the other courageous and powerful things that come from the fire. This is a circle of witches from South Street in Philadelphia. They call themselves Wiccans and celebrate the pagan rituals that were practiced over a thousand years ago in Europe. There are different kinds of witches, just like there are different kinds of Christians and different kinds of Hindus and so on. I am a witch because um, I worship the old gods, uh, I practice magic, I uh, teach a craft which is passed from witch to witch. From the goddess and to her we shall return. They're nature worshipers, they're goddess worshipers, they believe in the natural healing powers of magical practice. O oh, Lady of the White Moon, we seek you this night. Bless us and protect us. Keep us always in your light. While some witch groups or covens use black magic to harm others, many witches forbid such practices. I would not use magic to harm anyone. Uh, I would not allow anyone in my group to use magic like that. Magic is a collection of rule of thumb techniques. It's an art form, it's uh, a philosophy, it's a uh, scientific approach, it's all these different things. And what it is designed to do is to enable you to uh, generate psychic energy, shape it, and use it to make changes in the external or internal environment. Wiccans have not only been accused of black magic, they are often confused with Satanists. We have no link with the pagans also, because pagans, like Judeo-Christians and other religions, believe in gods and goddesses. We don't care whether one believes in one god or a bunch of gods. That's completely antithetical to Satanism. We believe in no gods save ourselves. When you're talking about Satanists, you're talking about fascists, jerks, and psychopaths. You're not talking about people who are involved in anything even vaguely resembling a legitimate religion. You don't actively work to harm anyone unless they have moved to harm you specifically. We advocate revenge where someone has attacked you. Now, you should do this within the legal parameters of the society you're involved in. And if you feel strongly enough that justice has not been satisfied by that, you may choose to go beyond the legal parameters, but you have to be willing to accept the consequences of your actions. We are not devil worshippers. We do not believe that there is a god and a devil, and we have opted to follow the devil and thus be Christian heretics, in a sense. We throw all of that out and say there is no god, there is no devil, there is no Christ. Satan for us, originally in ancient Hebrew, meant the adversary or opposer or accuser. And we believe that we are the adversaries. They don't believe that Satan is a real deity. For them, Satan is a symbol for everything that is greatest about human beings. And for them, that is what is most bestial about people. The fact that they have carnal cravings, lust, greedy desires, and ambition. Basically, in a satanic ritual, one starts in complete darkness. You light the candles and then ring the bell nine times. That purifies the chamber from all outside influences. And one picks up the sword and points it at the symbol of Baphomet, which is the focal point of the ritual. Then the ritual goes very specifically as notated in the Satanic Bible. Uh, after the invocation to Satan, there's uh, drinking from the chalice and reading of various invocations. And then we basically move into the centralized section of the ritual, which is directed toward whatever specific end one wants to achieve. And finally, we uh, salute Satan by giving the sign of the horns and end the ritual by ringing the bell nine times again. In American folklore, Satanists and witches are the same, but in reality, they are quite different. The witch is only a benevolent figure and uh, usually a, a, a woman can be a man who is in tune with nature and the, and the spiritual forces that surround us. In Satanism, you have a totally different use of the term witch, someone who knows how to turn 
Christian concepts and traditions upside down and inside out, who can officiate at a black mass, who can teach invocations of, who can say invocations of lust and destruction, vengeance of one kind or another. What Americans term witches and witchcraft are really four distinct groups. Satanism, voodoo, Wicca, and neo-paganism. We are part of the overall neo-pagan community, which consists of a number of different uh, religious movements that have all been founded around the ideas of nature worship, uh, multiplicity of deities, uh, adaptation to Aquarian Age ideals, if you will. It is natural for Christians to lump together neo-paganism and Satanism as equally demonic activities. From a historical perspective, however, they're utterly different. Witchcraft became, you know, anybody was doing anything bad. Um, any kind of spells, healing, midwifery, um, being ugly, being frightening, and, and pretty soon the, uh, the persecutions were way out of control. From Salem in the 1690s to South Street, Philadelphia in the 1990s, Americans have attempted to dispel witches, sometimes through persecution, other times through prosecution and today, sometimes, through prejudice. You would think that 301 years after Salem, people would be a little bit more cautious about pointing fingers at neighbors or friends or family, but people are not cautious in this regard. Witch! I am not a witch! witch! According to a recent report in Ms. Magazine, witchcraft, along with paganism, is one of the fastest growing religions in the country. An estimated 200,000 men and women are currently practicing Wiccan. But somehow, after centuries of myths and misconceptions, there seems a long way to go before most people can think of witchcraft as spiritual rather than supernatural.